Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this evening's presentation by the Heritage Society of Engineers Island. I particularly like to welcome members of Engineers Island Conservation Group uh, and any visitors present, particularly those who are joining us online this evening. Um, for those in the hall, I must just draw your attention to the uh, exits from the hall in the unlikely event that we have a fire or some other emergency. Um, they're on the way you entered and through the emergency doors in the right-hand corner of the hall. Now, our speaker this evening is Chartered Engineer Ivor McElveen, and Ivor is a board member of the Heritage Council. He is a director of Icomos Island, a former chairman of Building Limes Forum Island, a founder of the Engineers Island Conservation Group, and currently serves on the Heritage Society Committee. Uh, he studied lime mortars at the Scottish Lime Centre Trust and West Dean College, and serves on the steering committee of the Hot Mix Mortar Collaboration with Historic Environment Scotland and Historic England. Uh, Ivor is principal of Ivor, Ivor McElveen Associates, uh, which is a company uh, that provides conservation engineering services uh, specialising in masonry structures. In his presentation, um, Ivor will give a brief introduction to the history and use of lime mortars in the conservation and restoration of our built heritage. So it gives me much pleasure to invite Ivor to give his presentation. Ivor. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you, Ron, for those words. Um, we have a journey of about 10,000 years and back again this evening, so I'll be very quick. But I'd like to acknowledge one Edward Byrne, because if I say anything wrong or do anything awful, it's his fault, because about nearly 20 years ago, I suppose, Ed got me involved in the lime business. In fact, the Scottish Lime Centre Trust I went to, Ed took me to. But Ed most probably will think I was a bad pupil after all this is over, but we'll see how it goes. Can you hear me okay? Good. Okay, let's, before we get into let's get some of the fundamental things down why we're doing it. Um, that's the principles of conservation. Um, it's minimum intervention with maximum retention. It's repair like with like. And the where practical is an engineering attachment and reversibility within reason. Um, lime can achieve all these goals, while other materials, and uh, certainly binders, cannot. Now, um, why the engineer is involved in conservation is that they use the discretion of reason. Uh, I think Ron will know my prof was Prof White, Prof Wright, and one of the things he used to say is, there's a lot of common but not much sense around at times when engineers are tackled on, on projects. And I think common sense could apply often a lot more to things conservation, particularly when you have a sick or an ill building. Now, if we're talking about mortars, it's no harm just to always bear in mind it is geologically dependent, i.e. the geophysical nature of your, your, your mountains and your land make you. It's climatic. In other words, the climate will have a big bearing on your design and use on the purpose of mortar. Its application, what has been used for, it has a whole range of applications, as we'll see, both as a bedding mortar to a highly delicate decorative work. What period are we in, if we're in conservation? Are we the 12th century, where things are pretty straightforward to a large degree? Or are we in the, the 18th and 19th century, where things are getting a lot more complicated? What culture are we in? What sort of the building culture or dwelling they have? And last but not least, the skill involved available to you to solve a particular problem. These are all aspects that you have to consider when you're at Lyme. And I can safely say when people are having arguments about mortars, they're usually in the wrong century, the wrong country, or the wrong climate, and they're talking close purposes. So I'll just say that as a passing. Okay, Lyme, and by the way, I should say, a lot of people, I'm not going to satisfy anyone tonight because I must probably say too much that you know already or not say enough who feel that those don't know enough. So, but I'll try and steer a course through it. And it really is only 
uh, an hour talking or less about it. It can be a very broad subject. But anyway, it's a natural material. That doesn't make it good, bad, or indifferent. A lot of natural materials are good or bad, but it is a natural material. We have plenty of it in this country. Special characteristics from a water point of view, and these are sort of common layman's words, but it's true, it's breathable. It allows certain vapors and moistures to pass through it if it's designed properly. It's flexible. It has autogenous characteristics in a free line. Can, the crystal can repair itself and bend. This is very, very popular, uh, very useful uh, characteristic when you are building medieval times and you know foundations and you're dealing with articulated structures and so on. So it could correct itself and set in. And it's autogenous in correcting itself. It can re reset itself. So the flexibility allows uh, for, um, in fact, um, thermal movement. You don't have to have expansion joints in a lime water construction because the lime does it for you. It's environmental friendly. It's said carbon neutral. That isn't quite correct because the fuel to use it doesn't come back. But it does basically throw out carbon dioxide and sucks it back in again to form the limestone. That's roughly it. So it's got a lot of things going for it in that regard. It's recyclable, which is important. Uh, again, some of the modern materials are, are anything but recyclable. It's aesthetically pleasing. It's the thing we're used to, and it has a thing called a double refractive index. In other words, it handles light in a double vision, and it sort of looks nice and pleasing, um, and it's the thing we're comfortable with. And it's really a must for all solid wall construction, irrespective of the protected structures or not. Okay, the quick chemistry of it and the history of it will be done on one slide very quickly. It's, um, lime is a, uh, let me see, okay, it's um, calcium carbonate, CO, and you burn it. This is very simple um, to make a quick lime, which is CO2, that's calcium and oxygen. Then you slake it by adding water to make it a lime hydrate, known as a hydrated lime. And depending on the amount of water added, it can be produced as a powder form, a lime potty, or a hot mix. And really, that's the basic, simple chemistry of the thing. It sets by carbonation. In other words, you add water to it. Uh, sorry, um, it sets by carbonation. The water goes out, it dries out, and in the process, it takes back in the carbon, and you're back into the limestone that you started with. That's why those things are in green. And that's roughly it. And everything else is a complication of that. There is one variation in that is the, the limestone itself, of course, depending on various limestones they are. And there's two sort of common ones. Obviously, there's the magnesium, but I'm not going to get involved in, in the geology of it. But the limestone comes in two forms, an ordinary limestone and a limestone with certain, what are technically impurities, usually clay or aluminum um, deposits, and these make hydrated limes. They have a chemical set. So you have the ordinary free lime, common lime, and then you have a hydraulic lime, which can make a chemical set, and I'll come back to that. <clears throat> the lime has a great use, of course, in agriculture, building decoration, disinfectant, many industrial uses, including water purification, the steel, the chemicals. In fact, it's a wide material, and in fact, it's one of those materials that some used to say you should be called the, um, the fifth element of the, of the, the earth, fire, water, and um, what is it? Earth, fire, water. What's wind. the fourth? Wind. Hmm? Wind. Wind. Mm -hmm. Isn't it wind? Air, air, yeah, air, yeah. And then we could add lime, it is the fifth, mm -hmm. so vast. It's kind of first recorded, it uh, in, in, has been found dating to back about 10,000 years. Um, it's extensive use in Roman times, which became really popular. That's the sort of the cultural civilization we come from in that regard. It came to Ireland around 900 AD thanks to the emissions coming through, so with an imported technology. It's, uh, it's locally known as a manure stone in our language, because uh, it's used for <coughs> the land. And then Vicat really set it down um, in 1837 to go on with. It does, of course, uh, it has little inter interludes in that. The Abyssinians really were the first recorded version of lime around 2500 BC. Uh, the Egyptians with their gypsum and lime uh, of uh, about 1930 BC. The Greeks, 400 BC, brought in lime into its own. The Romans then brought it in with Vesuvius and are, are formed today. 
from 800 and then to 70 AD. That was their, their, their strong point in Lyme development technology. And so it goes on to Smeaton in 1790, 1750 AD, who developed really into cements. Uh, with Vicat in 1837, he was a French engineer who wanted something to set quickly for a sapper work and so on, and indeed still in natural cements has. And then Portland cement came in, as we know today, in 1824, and has grown ever since, and stronger ever since. So that's roughly it. You have a lime kiln up there on the right of your screen, a typical one. And you have the lime kiln at Rusborough, and I don't have any more slides on it really, but this is one developed by the at Rusborough House, and it was a project of the Billy Lime Forum that Lisa Eden did, and that was re revived and actually burnt limestone, and a very successful venture it was into lime, and it contributed to the revival of quicklime. The lime cycle you must probably all know with, and this is a very simple version. Um, if I use this as a pointer, you put your limestone into the top with your fuel, you burn it, and you take your quick lime outside in the front, you bring it over then, and you have your slake lime, and you can make a hot mix mortar out of that known as, or go and partly work with the hydrate, which it doesn't add enough water in to make it a powder, or can go into making lime putties, and then it goes into a building form. This obviously either is a hydrate or a lime putty, which is used, the, and then it, um, it, it takes in the water, it takes, lets out the water, it takes in the oxide, and it's back into the limestone, and that's the basic lime cycle. If you had a hydraulic lime in that, you would, have a, you would have a chemical set, and at this level, as well as having a carbonation, which that's called carbonation taking back, you would have a chemical set parallel with it, and that's the difference. And hydraulic really simply applies, and we must not confuse any of those between a hydrate and a hydraulic. A hydrate is a lime that's made into port, port of form, which is here. The hydraulic is an actually separate item, separate element, separate material, um, which uh, uh, it's called hydraulic because it's set under water. That's its basic characteristic. Okay, there you are. There's your limestone. There's your quick lime. Uh, burnt in the centre, which you can make a hot mix out of. And then up above you have a lime putty, and then you have your hydrated lime. So the hydrated limes can be air limes, or an hydraulic lime, or hydraulic lime, as I've just mentioned to you. So we'll talk about natural hydraulic limes, because these are the most popular and available in the country. They form uh, of a pure lime with natural mineral additives, which is sort of the best way to describe it. They have a chemical set and also carbonation. They come in three basic strengths, an LH2, 3.5, and a 5. And you use these depending on how you want to design your mortar. It's supplied in bag form. It's currently popular for exterior use in particular. And it sets under water, as I was described. And it's an excellent material. And when appropriately specified um, and used, it's, it's highly successful. There have been some research done lately that would uh, would indicate that it hasn't always been appropriately specified. No, those buildings below have been successfully done with hydraulic limes of one sort or another, although the one in the centre, in fact, was a very adventurous lime putty, a job in Donegal. So, the quick lime then, you have your limestone again, as I described above, and the quick lime is in granulated form. Now this, how we have it, and how quicklime hasn't been used previously, is that it's considered um, not only a hazardous, but even a dangerous substance, and it wasn't in a form that was readily available, and so this, had, this caused problems. And in fact, in the early 90s, the English Heritage took a view on it and decided it couldn't go that way because of health and safety. It's now back on the market, or it's now on the market in various forms, and indeed, Buxton Lime have a, have a brochure that they sell in the UK as a quick lime. Because with the collapse of our sugar company, uh, CRH in their clock Grenadine lime decided they'd make a lime for conditioning the soil, and it's called Gromax. And it's in bag form, kebbled bag form, that's um, granulated. It's um, relatively dust free, not quite dust free. 
But the farmer now can throw that with impunity around the place on his ground. There are advantages of using it for farming, but it so happens it's an ideal source of quicklime for the builder or the lime person who wants to use lime because he, it, it's made, it's of a low quality which suits us. It's nearest to the lime kin you'll get commercial, um, commercially. It has a certain unburnt or overburnt and that's guaranteed allegedly to around 50% and that suits us quite well. You can design for that. And so the average builder can go down to the local co-op and get a bag of quick lime or the farm supplier, which is a, a big change of life. So I'm going to talk about hot mix mortars because that is the, the latest current phrase and it's indeed where it all started in the first place. In the 10,000, 10 million years ago, 10,000 years ago, the um, Abyssinians would have been dealing with the type of scenario that we're going to talk about now. It's on like slaking, uh, it's quick lime with sand aggregate, and usually gauge with an NADL or POSM to give us a, a mild hydraulic set and sometimes an additive can be added, wood ash or brick dust. In fact, the additives are usually what were available. And the additives in the early parts were nothing to do with getting quick or hard sets. They're usually designed by the masons of the day to get a set, to get a set of the Klerana conditions that they had. Like the mason today, he doesn't want to be called back on the job. He wants the stuff to work and move on to the next one. Nothing has changed, and that's why they use additives a lot. It is a doubling factor, of course, it expands when you're slaking it. So if you use it hot, it'll expand in the air you're in. This can have advantages and kind of disadvantages. It's not very good for brickwork, for instance, in that regard to use hot because you can get your bricks lifting and so on. Um, the, it can be used hot or cold. In fact, it's the original of the coarse stuff. When it was gauged later, and um, its historic mortar mix reckoned that uh, in its dark use, they reckon about 70% of mortars came from a hot mix method of making mortars, yeah, during, and was up to about 70% at the turn of the last century. It is, as it stands now, usually the, uh, usually the most authentic replacement available in performance specification. It doesn't actually look like, but you can do that. And, but you can design a mortar pretty similar to what is the mortar you're taking out using the hot mix method design. They are photographs at the bottom showing the where we, um, with Portamina, the OPW, in a phase one of a project, which I'll talk about, did various testing on brick limes and how it's worked. There's an early example of a wall being built, and that's at Drimna Castle, where we're the Scots over, showing us how they did it. So it really comes about from what BLFI did. The BLFI, by the way, the Billy Lime Forum of Ireland, in case you don't know, it really sponsored the idea. And we produced a report called Phase One on the Hot Lime Mortar Project. Mm -hmm. And that was the kind of seed to the development, really in these islands, uh, of the hot mix method using quick lime. Although co coincidentally, when you invent things or get movements, you find other people are doing the same thing. So in the journeys, we found other people doing it, and we came together and formed the collaboration between the various bodies that we've just, I'll come to in a bit. So we went to Scotland because we discovered that in fact it was still being used in Scotland. It was somewhat under the radar. It hadn't got official blessing, but contractors were using it. And they're using it for, for reasons that will, were self-explanatory, that the climate wouldn't let the NHOs work to their, to their mason's liking from time to time, and also they were in one area, they're using a very hard granite and they couldn't get the adhesion they needed. Um, we, the Hotline Mortar Project was basically a transfer to technology in Scotland to see would it work for us over here using comparative uh, testing materials. Because clearly, as I said, the geology depends very much on how you get on with your particular material. So we want to see that our limestone compare favorably with theirs for designing mortars. And that was done quite well under phase one, and so we came up with some formulations for that. And the output was some technical literature with specifications and applications, and of course, good health and safety practice. 
Uh, the people involved in this, of course, was the department, the Heritage Council funded it, CRH also funded it, and the OPW um, came aboard, in fact, one of the partners of the thing, and the building line form itself. That report is actually on that website down below if anyone ever wants to look at it. But it's kind of old hat now, but it is the origin of the whole idea. Um, the overall objective then of the collaboration, which includes the Stark Environment Scotland, the Stark England, and the Caddo of Wales and HD Dublin Ireland, was to um, the the overriding objective of these collaborations was to establish the safe and sound basis for the practice and use of hot mixed lime mortars and renders in their various forms and involve education, training and some testing. Uh, the collaboration itself would facilitate, and so doing it exceptionally well, a joint working on projects and shared innovation so we'd avoid duplication, uh, share procedures, findings and share information results on research and development. And that's come to the fore admittedly more from the Scots than the English from our side, but we were benefiting from it, and uh, we, we may reciprocate in time. Again, the photographs below show the testing areas and the meetings we had, and the cubes that went over to Scotland for testing to compare it with their own mortars. This was all done in Port Tumna Castle under the OPW. Also, health and safety was done there as well. So what's it all about? Well, what's it all about, really, this is an oversimplification, as these are, but you actually slay can make. So instead of going through the process of making various forms of lime, they just made the slaking, um, put in the aggregated mortar, and back straight up. So it was really a very simple process. Now, that's an example, of course, what you'd use for bedding mortar. You might twig it and do different things for other mortars to be know what you do. And actually, if you think about it, and this has come through, and um, Stan Stevens, it doesn't matter anyway, uh, it actually was kind of just in time because the ancients did have problem storage, big, big problem, and transport was a pain in the butt. So if they could get the material to arrive in, that is, just lime, aggregate, and water, mix it up, throw it in, next please. It was just-in-time management, and it made a lot of sense. Also, if they're using a quick lime, it didn't really matter about moisture, because they could adjust it accordingly. They went into the cooking business, and that was the basis of, and the reason why, hot-mixed mortars were so popular. They're easy to manage, and they're readily available. No, I'm locked. Is there a nose there over? Hmm? Click on the white paper. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Click on the white paper. Good. Um, <coughs> so the advantage of the hot mix lime water that comes out from Pat McAvee, who some of you know, uh, and he was a he was a, a, a colleague working on the report, but he reckoned, and has been proven since by masons and users, his high workability. Um, it's a very attractive mortar. In fact, that's the old masonry test up there. If it sticks to the other side of the trowel, they kind of love it. It's their idea of heaven. Increased productivity because of that. They have the less overgoing the work than some other mortars. It's fuller and compressed the vertical joints. That's the mason who's good at it, can make it work much better. You can use stones wet or damp. It's no great difficulty. That can be a problem elsewhere. They consider a skilled mason would have much cleaner work, no run-down face of the stones, and able to build higher without squeeze. And this has been found, by the way, even juicing in America, the masons have found this to be so. The joint service can be finished the same day. It eliminates touching up afterwards. It replicates the original strike mortar, which you may like, and it further increases in production when used warm. These can be advantages. Pat McVie, who you don't know him, is unfortunately retired. I miss him very much, but that's one of the books he wrote. He was also an author, a bit of a Renaissance man. Another Renaissance man, Nigel Copsey, these are the people who we, we met during the course of our visits. He was another mason in Yorkshire, and he's also an academic. Um, in fact, he's, he's got a 
a degree in political science. So an amazing degree in political science as can usually persuade his point. He's also a great promoter of hot mixed mortar. And he is doing research for English heritage and publishing with Hearts Ark Scotland texts of old texts on hot on the use of hot mix and quicklime mortars. For some reason the academics didn't spot these because they weren't masons, they didn't understand it. And uh, they, also there was a great reaction to using quicklime, it must be dangerous, we can't do it. But there's a heap of texts, and he's done research and brought it back up. And these are just two examples. This is the De La Faye in 1777. If we mix two parts of sand freshly extracted from the river with one part of powder quicklime, it will create a very fatty and adherent mortar. And that was the specification. And here we go from 1859 in Ottawa. Mortar to be used as hot as possible and no more mortar mixed on one day than can be used on the same. In other words, he didn't want any coarse stuff around. You, you used your hot mortar hot for the job that's been done. So it's been done. So we have a happy little mason up there. We have happy little masons working away. And that's actually a medieval mortar mill that we designed, or Pat Hickey designed another mason and it's in the Heritage Park in Wexford, and it actually works exceptionally well. We built um, a medieval pigsty during one Heritage Week, which we'd rather fun with. I don't know if anyone was that. Anyway, okay, health and safety. Let's get it clear about health and safety. Um, it is a hazardous material, and so are most of the materials one uses. Um, I'd rather fun with health and safety because it was really one of the hurdles we had to uh, get over, and it was um, challenging in its own way. Um, it is no more uh, than the personal PPE equipment than you'd have, that you should have uh, on a site and over the table. There is it. There is the glasses, the gloves, the face mask, and an eye wash. Now the eye wash is the eye wash used, as it so happens, although I have one shown on the screen as well. That's used by CRH uh, as their standard form. And Clark Brennan gave us um, quite a good health and safety training and how to work it out and what to do. And uh, so that's really health and safety. Um, all I can say is that with, when I was getting it with the Department of Agriculture, they were actually because I, I had to explain why do people throw this with impunity on the land if it's, if it's meant to be so dangerous or a hazard, which is different between danger and hazard. And the department said it's, it's absolutely fine, they're quite satisfied with it. And then quickly added, the average farmer is actually using far more dangerous materials with the chemicals than, um, than quicklime. <clears throat> so that was it. Uh, in our demonstrations, we always give the demonstration station. In fact, that is the sort of station one should have on, on any site for any material you're using, uh, in what have you. So you can ask questions about health and safety later. While we're talking the table, there are samples of, of the mortars there. Some of them are hybrids gauged with NHLs. The large one is just a quick lime and sand. And then the examples on the far side on your right is uh, our samples of old um, of uh, various mortars of, of sorts. Okay, um, when we got this going, the Scots decided with the Scottish Lime Centre, support HSE, to do research. Because one of the things we did do here, we discovered a way of actually making quite clear it was a quick lime mix, not a lime putty. That was one of the big debates holding it back and that's been satisfied. And on that basis, they researched um, a database of about 3,407, I don't know why, the seven samples of heritage mortars they collected over the years. And they were tested to see what indeed were of quicklime origin. And they did it by, by characteristic use. And of the Harleen, which is their, their rough outside, rough cast outside render, 81%, with quicklime made. The bedding mortar is 78%, the pointing mortar is 72%, render, that's more fine plaster work, 45%. But 
plaster itself inside a 43% and then others and so it went on. And that's out of Scotch line base. So that was quite an eye opener and uh, it was revealing. Now there, there are stories behind each one of those I can answer. It isn't quite as simple as it says, but that's basically where hot mix was used. And that's the degree of using the hot mix solution to make those mortars in the samples dating from the 16th century to the present day. They also looked with Craig Crewe and others um, at the hydraulicity of the mortars and the pie chart explains that very well. Um, non to feebly hydraulic was 66%, moderately hydraulic 15 and so it goes on. So all mortars were mildly <coughs> hydraulic. What we're not too sure about is the origin of hydro hydraulicity because we can't obviously trace what was used of the day. But it, some people think it was impurities, some people think actually various positives were added in that are not recognisable today. But the very mild hydraulic, when we're talking very mildly, we're talking about a, a Newton strength or a mega, mega Pascal strength of less than two. So we're not really talking very much. And that's out of 962 samples that were done. Of the binder type uh, used in the century, from the 16th century onwards, the, the, the blue, it, can you see that well enough? Okay. The blue is actually, again, a hot mix system, and you can see it changing and getting more complicated as you get into the 20th century, where lime mortars and hot lime in particular fell out of use, thanks to the two world wars in particular, for very valid reasons at the time. You can see the growth in, um, in lime putties, and this was a refinement. And indeed, in, in the latter part, it's from the 17th, 18th, 19th century, that really represents the amount of ornamental stucco work and the stucco door that appeared on the scenes as much as anything else, and the great houses and the wealth of the British Empire, and so it goes on. But you can see that the hot mix method dominated the making of mortars. And if you do a like for like want to replicate, it's obviously a very ser serious alternative for consideration in designing a mortar. Now, what has actually happened with various research, all this coincided at one time, uh, David Wiggins did um, a P his PhD on poor structures of mortars and materials, both lime, NHLs, and free limes, and the and cements, because he wanted the, his, the, the phenomena of this scalding. It was so well thought of by the peers, including the Hydrawatt University, that it Stark Scotland converted into a, in a technical paper. And it's hotline mortars, microstructure and function. Now in the graph, which you get the pore size against the, the you can see then the various turns and where you get into an area, a pore size less than 200, it, it won't work. And with the <clears throat> cement, I can't read it yet, porosity, you have a very different, this is your cement against your lime. Um, and this is how big about that's a sandstone. I can't really make this out here, I go again. Um, the, your ineffective area of usage. The next graph will make this rather clear. In other words, you're limited to the pore strength you can do. And if you've got a pore strength that's limited, you'll have a phenomenon like you have here on the, on the pointing, a replacement pointing water. This is again using a sandstone where there is a combination of what's known as a siphon effect of your pores that pulls your moisture out, which will always be on the move. And if you, if you put, specify too hard a mortar like cement, as a pointing mortar, you will block it and you'll, it'll go over the side, as you can often see in brickwork, and you get the spalling of what has happened here. If, of course, it's an impervious stone, it just doesn't go out, it just stays back and makes the wall damp. So if you design a pointing mortar, it's not compatible with the bedding mortar, you can have that phenomenal, and it is happening. We certainly know it happens with cement, and now English Heritage have decided it's happened quite a lot with our NHL mortars, where they've been incorrectly specified. Nothing wrong with material, just wrong with the use. 
So back to the graph I just described, this is a, it's probably easier to look at. This is the pore structure of an historic mortar out of a castle, and it has a porosity of 35%. Because of this 200 mil, where this is out, which is very little, it's 15% ineffective. So you have 30% of your pore structure available relative to your mortar. That's quite high. That's good. If you go to an AGL 3.5, although we don't specify, they vary on manufacture, the story is somewhat different. Your 200 um, uh, mill um, come in at around uh, this area where it's up there so you have less and um, <clears throat> the porosity 50% ineffective for, uh, ineffective 14% available 50% is ineffective and 14% available if you look at cement on the other hand you end up 60% ineffective and only 12% not available so there isn't that much difference and this was one of the things that concerned Stark England. I should say, by the way, as an as extraction, is that the, the compressive strength of a, of a mortar is a, an over-exaggerated phenomenon. It's not much interest. Much more important are the, its porosity, its bond strength, its flexural strength, workability, and water relativity, and retaining waters, particularly if it's... Um, going to handle like a harling on, on the surface, the blotting paper rule of a plaster. These are much more important. And um, it's been now recognized, in fact, the compressive strength testing for mortars is against concrete, really, just, just not comparable. And particularly we're dealing with a lime mortar, and that's likely to change in the future. For instance, George and Dublin would be built roughly, if you want to go to Newton's, it's not important. If it's if it's, uh, if it's two or less, that's about it. Certainly no more. And that's four stories. One of the reasons why the NHLs vary, and it's very the manufacturer, is that the testing system and the criteria used while it suits the manufacturer doesn't really suit the builder. Here's a case of various five uh, NHL fives in 28 days going from six to 14 newtons. Um, yeah, 6 to 14 newtons. Just one sec. Let me come back. Okay. Oh, yes, that's I'm right here. That's, I've missed this. Th this is out of uh, another paper just come out on, the, on July of this year done by um, Bath University, financed by uh, English Heritage, and the Billy Nine form as a thesis by, now he's now a doctor, I can't pronounce it now, Figadero of University of Bath, Department of Engineering, the properties and forms of blind mortars for conservation. They wanted to look, they were using these NHLs and no one independently did a proper assessment of them, and they found some interesting results. In fact, so much so they're taking it up with the manufacturers. This is a very old, old um, uh, graph, but it shows the range of NHL fives from four to say just fifteen, from so from five to fifteen, NHL three point five, uh, from well just below four up to ten, and so on. Now, what he discovered, other graphs. I don't want to use this work because I don't have a copyright to it showed that the various manufacturers vary considerably and did not do what they said on the tin. One manufacturer was particularly good and, and managed to always keep it the way it should be. In fact, some of the manufacturers at 3.5 would end up stronger than the 5. And unfortunately, one manufacturer, after a year, the NHL2 beat both the others. That's the point. With the carbonation that continues, your NHLs actually will creep up to much higher strength. So in three or four years' time, you could have an ill-designed mortar coming in with a Newton of 20. Now, that itself kind of wouldn't matter, but with your increase of compressive strength, your flexibility drops, uh, and all other characteristics drop as well. So you can get cracking and you can get what they discuss now, the Damtar syndrome. And some old NHLs put in are not working because of that. Now, in most cases, if you're doing a garden wall or a monument, that <coughs> most probably won't be the end of the world. But if you're doing a residence and want comfort, 
you, you can and will have problems. Um, the, also below is a paper done again by Craig Frew, by Sark Scotland, looking at the mortars we discovered uh, that were done since 1997 to, 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 to today to see how they performed, the hot mixes performed. And all these hot mixes, by the way, were gauged with an NHL. It was decided for our climates, which is very similar to Scotland, it is usually the best and the safest to design. And they all, without exception, performed exceptionally well. The only areas where there are failures, and this is an independent assessment, was because of architectural detailing. It wasn't the mortar itself. So what do we have? Okay, the hot mix method, this is just to let you know what happens. It's a very simple shovel. You put your granulated in, you, you cover it up for a while with a bit of water, you knock it up, and then you have your mortar. And here we have Nigel Cop saying, this is the signal of a mason. There he is, he has his mortar sticking to the bottom of the tower, he's happy as a sound boy. I just thought I'd put Pat McAvee in as he's there mixing his mortar. And this is Chris Pennock, this is another person we, we discovered on our journeys. And Chris Pennock is an interesting person, he's the senior cathedral mason in Trondheim, the national cathedral of Norway. And uh, he independently developed a hotline mix to solve a problem that they couldn't solve for ages. In fact, it's known as the King's Entrance. It was built in the 70s. It had to be taken down again. And now that it's, they found a mortar that works. And independently, he came up with his own solution. And we work with him in the transfer. He's actually an Englishman who's been living in Norway for more years than I can remember. Also, uh, you know, an, an academic mason. These are our Renaissance people and they've contributed an awful lot. It's interesting to know that, in fact, it is, is a combination of craft and academia that finds a solution before they were working separately and they didn't catch on. This is Chris Blundell. Uh, Ed knows quite well. This is a very simple example. For those who are not familiar, uh, it shows what's happened when you use specified the wrong stuff, this time with cement. 1900s, a proud little house, which you can see there, happy. Obviously, the children get it, and in the 1960s, or there, they're about decided they're going to get rid of all this lime that keeps falling off, and it'll cement it up and have a real humding house with a car and the garage, and everything will be happy, maintenance free ever after. We'll go up to the 1980s, and actually, Chris tells me that photograph is not twisted. That house is bursting, the water in the walls. You know, you can see, you can see it's, it's sort of bulging, it's, it's, it's going obese. And when they took it down, they found very, I don't know if you can see those too well, the various cracks. People thought they were structural cracks, they were just bursting cracks. Just, it was a fabric failure, it wasn't a structural failure with the water. So it was duly um, uh, rendered, and in 2012, you had a back, warm, comfortable, usable house, and they were all lived happily ever after with a properly specified NHL, I quickly add, which was a two not a 3.5 or not a 5. So there's another case of it. I'm coming to the end now, really. Um, St. Duven's Church, it, that's what it was. It was sketch 1850s. It was deteriorating badly. And by 2012, that's what it would look like. The, um, before that, uh, I used to go to it to Billy Colfer, some of you may know. and. We regret it because it's quite an iconic church. St. Juven's were the, the monks that lit the fire of the Hook Lighthouse, the original and the oldest working lighthouse in the world. In fact, it's the cradle of, of the civilization. St. Juven was a wet saint that came over and formed its cult and dedicated the lighthouse. Um, during the storm, I gather, after 1970, which you'll see the picture there, it, it fell down. But Billy, I was walking with Billy around it, and I said, it's an awful pity it can't be put back. This restoration business would be nicer it could be done because it's such an iconic thing. And he said, well, there are the stones. We, we stored them. So National Monuments got excited about that. We made a case, and we got a very good mason, um, Martin Codd, an old masonry family of Wexford, and built a vector, photographed up, put projections on the wall. He could recognize the various stones involved. We assembled like a jigsaw and restructured the bell coat. 
And it was the first time the National Monument Service kind of allowed that for a long time. And so that's what it is today on the bottom right hand. So we restore the church. Now, what had more to do with that? We actually used um, a laboratory in Scotland and did an analysis of the mortars and found two different types of mortars from the centuries. And um, uh, we redesigned those to perform. We twigged them a little bit to be a bit better, but they would have to be compatible with existing mortars and worked. And it was very interesting. We found out, and I haven't discussed aggregates, and that's another story, but it's very important you get the right aggregates as well, just as the mortar. And often, actually, mortars fail because of the choice of aggregate, not because of the, the lime put in, be it an NHL or a uh, free lime. Uh, <coughs> They actually went up river to get the aggregate. They didn't take it straight from them, so that was quite a thought to do. There's the uh, <clears throat> Crimea car. It was hit by lightning and it was pretty shook. So it was reconstructed, repaired with a lightning conductor. And again, we got the mortars designed. We took analysis of the mortar and put in a compatible mortar. And that's why some of the existing mortars were working very well, had another 200 years in them, judging by the performing, so only replaced where they were badly weathered with a compatible mortar. And it worked exceptionally well and still there today. If any of you in Kilkenny, um, this was one of the first things. Obviously, one needs patronage on these things in you know, Kilkenny. County Council, when we were doing the hot mixes, back to this as a little project, this is the Kansas Steps just near the cathedral. And we actually put in various mortars, various formulations, because it's, nothing was life-threatening. The whole arch had collapsed, we had to build it up, that's a structural thing, we repaired it to various mortars. And we have a drawing showing the various mortars, and we look at those from time to time to see how they're doing. In fact, they're all doing fine in spite of the various mixes. In fact, I get the impression that hot mix mortars are very tolerant mortars, and happy to go with. This is um, a house by the author, author just done. It was a case where, uh, and again it's masonry and mortar. The, the original quote was going to demolish this wall, which you can see has been held by, where am I? Okay, it's been held by steels. Um, it was bulging and breaking. And we discovered mainly because this was a, a Georgian house that was converted this was a farmhouse converted into Georgian, and the room, you could tell it was a hodgepodge because they had no decent rooms. The existing rooms were done. That meant clearly uh, holes were made on walls to create windows. But we found this was the entrance, and the original entrance door was just under that bush, if I can get my oak, and that had caused weakness. Um, we managed with um, uh, the mason to... Uh, do a proper arching repair on the wall and just the outside skin and not demolish the wall and that's just the finish. We managed to save the patrimony of the original plaster which would have gone if the turn had been done and it was done at a, a fraction of the price of a building a whole new gable and save money and the quick lime version was used, the hot mix version was used great success. But we get onto other things. This is very interesting. This is, I don't know if you're aware of the glass scheme. This is the cap where farmers can apply to do up their agricultural buildings and they get a grant for it. And of course, now the farmer's delighted. That stuff he throws in the ground, he can actually make a mortar out of. And so you get in a lot of DIY. And this is a case of um, a farm building that was done that way. And you can see the difference it creates to the landscape. <coughs> you know, the, 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 the building that's done, what it was like just before and after. And it's been very successful. This is another little case about a garden farm buildings. Um, that's what it was and that's what it is today. And it's interesting now though, we've done a journey, <clears throat> I suppose, of 10,000 years. And it started with rural development, farmers, in Abyssinia 10,000 years ago using the same thing and here we're now doing the same thing in Ireland in this century and that's kind of a nice feeling and a lot of people enjoy that. Also it's a mortar that's indigenous, it's effective and it can be designed to work very well for what it is. And that's really the end but I usually like this little uh, picture photograph which I took some time ago because there's a lot of a story in it. Not only do we have the building technology change from man from the 14th century 
to the 20th with the Cranach Castle and the suspension bridge spanning the, the, uh, at, uh, at Waterford, which you may be familiar with it, spanning, which is the Barrow, is it? Sure, sure. Sure, sure, yeah, fine. Sure. Um, and it shows that even those in the time of the 14th century, the Shure was the form of transport and the castle was to control that and the bridge in the 20th century spans across it. So it's a contrast of time, very interesting. The common feature is, and it's an interesting one, lime was used in both the bridge, the steelwork, and in the castle. In fact, the chances are there's more lime used in the steel than there was in the castle. And that's it. Thank you. I hope I wasn't too quick, but that's it. Okay? I'm sure Ed has a question for me. I think I sort of atrophied like the lion, you know. Well, folks, first of all, I'm sure you'd like me to convey our thanks in the usual way to Ivo for a very detailed analysis of what hot lime and other sorts of lime is, is all about. I think I've learnt a little bit more, but I, I, I'm getting there very slowly. Yeah. But thanks very much. Um, now, are there any questions or comments from, from the audience? Uh, and I think if you use a mic microphone, it would be useful if you're speaking because uh, we're still online. Just two quick questions. Back to the microphone. Do you think lime should be used or is being used for a completely new building, say in brickwork? Uh, that's number one. And two, just you mentioned the lime and the steel and the bridge, and I'm unaware of how. Lime. Maybe you could explain the link between steel and lime on that bridge. Well, yes, I think the answer generally would be yes, certainly. Um, and in fact, there's a big revival in that, and that's where the future of the lime industry stands, not in conservation. And indeed, all the big suppliers like St. Astor, they actually do focus on new build and so on. The conservation side, although important, is really quite secondary. And they didn't fully understand conservation when the rigid went into it, so they gave recommendations for users that weren't quite, in the past, quite good, but that's changed now. Indeed, I like to think that one of the reasons why CRH took an interest in it, because you actually do have a carbon-neutral material relative to what's been used, and it's recyclable. I mean, I don't know if any of you see some of the demolition goes, these large lumps of concrete stones and bricks stuck to one another, or you can go for a dump. The ancients knew that they could d d dismantle and use those bricks again, and that's the lesson we would have, and Lyme lets you do that. So the answer is yes, we just haven't got around to addressing it properly, and I hope we will in the near future. Thanks very much, Ivor. Um, a couple of questions. One, um, I know you're not a chemist, and perhaps it's an unfair question, but uh, how do they distinguish between the components, the, 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 the lime in historic mortars? Uh, how does one know that it was hot lime versus, for example, just, just uh, lime putty or whatever? Yeah. Um, that's one question. The other, what was the other one I had? Um, anyway, I'll, I'll leave, leave it alone, yeah. Okay. Sorry, but, the other question I had was um, I, I was somewhat alarmed when you pointed out the fact that uh, the tests in England uh, discovered great variety in the strength and the carbonation rate and so forth of the different NHLs. Um, uh, is, is there any way of, if you're, if you're using lime, if you're using an NHL on a job, is there any way of checking it out? before you use it. I'll answer the first, the second question first. 
Uh, unfortunately, no. And you were alarmed, they were alarmed. So much so that they didn't accept the Bath University testing and sent it on to um, a second laboratory to test. And I now understand, this is just all hot, just off the press. I mean, one manufacturer did perform quite well. It did say what you got in the tin. And the others just didn't. They not only, they, their quality varied considerably to an alarming degree, to so much so that one would wonder should they be used in conservation, the unreliability of it. And it was not so much at the time, it's how they behaved in five or 10 years down the road, if that was it. And the, I understand, oh, this is all hot off the press. They're going to take it up with the manufacturers uh, to give them a chance to do their own test to see is it correct, because it is loaded. I do know that there was one plant from just a coincidental story, didn't make much <coughs> difference to me. There was one operation company that um, a cement manufacturer had an interest in, and it used the lime for it for its industrial processing and actually got rid of it because the lime was just so varied that the correction cost and the processing was such that they had to reject it and it was sold and it's now back in the building industry so that might answer the second question i'm not a material scientist but the the, the forms of molecules can indicate it now they can more or less be certain that it, it would be a hot lime against a lime putty. Now the scientists concentrated on that, I mean this is the, an oversimplification very much, but they also know the year and the period, so the social history of the time would also indicate it, so the evidence was there. But the most telling one is when Nigel Copsey got a piece of the English heritage, and one, one scientist was claiming it was, must have been a lime putty, he actually reconstructed the lime using a lime putty, and it was unusable. So it was a hot lime. Now, if you talk to any mason, I'm sure you have, and those who know, a quick lime mortar is a live mortar. They enjoy moving it. It, it swells. It just moves with it. While a lime putty mortar uh, is just dead mortar. It's just a dead mortar. Not that lime putty isn't valuable, but it's used internally. And that's how it came back into the fold, because that was the only technology left. And so we assumed that it was used outside. And that was a, in the early days of setting up the, the, the lime revival that caused a problem. Does that answer the question? Yeah. 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 It, this actually, in this report, there's a, it, it shows how they decided it was a quick lime version. It's against a lime putty. Now, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. well, uh, I'd like to just add to what you asked about the bridge and etc. It takes a ton of lime to make the average car. More lime goes into polo mints and toothpaste than into conservation garden. You know, I mean, lime is the most useful. But steel is just approximately a ton of lime for every ton of steel. So therefore, you know, it's lime. We're about 7% of lime. 7.5% of lime goes into building in Ireland. Of the 7.5%, only about 2.5% goes into conservation. So we're not even a pimple of the elephant. We're, we're, we're only a pimple on the elephant's pimple. Mm -hmm. And get, to get back to Irish thing, or, or what you asked about the different natural hydraulic lines, anybody who tells you their lime is the same as somebody else's natural hydraulic line, is either lying or no talking about that. There are no two natural hydraulic lines in the world that are the same because it all depends on the source rock. It's completely thing. And the problem is that people are taking other people's data sheets, copy and paste them, and using them as their own. They're not, it doesn't necessarily mean that that other line is bad or good. It just means they're not the same. They're completely and utterly different. And the problem now is that most of the people using lime are coming from the cement tradition. So they think the quicker it works, the faster it works, the better, which isn't. Isn't thing. I mean, that's basically what the problem with cement. And the, the other thing which I always find in all these presentations, I was not made reflection. We, we don't give enough uh, credit to the Irish people who were involved. Like Semple, practically predated Sweden, yet you never hear of them. He made the best statement ever made about lime. He said the only water should have to lime is the sweat of the workmen. In other words, proper mixing, and that's the biggest problem. That's simple. Simple. Yeah, mm, yeah. Simple, yeah. by the way, was an architect in the early 18th century in Dublin, yeah. designed basic or basic I mean, if, if just, to, just to endorse what to say, 
I mean, I did start off, geology is important. So your, your mother lime, the lime that you're, comes from, was equally important. And this is a problem they have in England. They have a number of lime supplies from different deposits. And wh how you treat one lime in one area to do a thing on another is different, because they are natural materials that you expect. We do have a good fortune, as my, well, maybe you could take two views on it, we've actually only one lime supplier, and we know the specification of it. So you can actually easily design mortars for that, because we know they won't go off and get a sharp as against a Buxton lime, which they have in England. Because how you make a mortar out of a sharp, how you design it and use it, and how you make it out of a Buxton, which are two examples of different sorts, are two different things. So Sorry. what Edward said is absolutely Sorry. true. Sorry, I have to add, all limes originally were hot mates. Whether they were used hot might be in debate, but they were originally hot mates. They were hot and hot mates because of the bulking up and the transport up. Regardless of which way they were used, that might be a question, but practically all limes were hot mates. No, the, the in, in common yeah. buildings, I mean, decorative work and all that is still mm -hmm. totally different and in terms yeah. of finishing, but for ordinary common work. No, they did use those coarse stuff. That's yeah. absolutely so. Mm -hmm. One one thing that uh, intrigued me uh, was uh, the mention of Ashler masonry. Uh, is there a difference when you're using mortar in in with Ashler masonry, or does it need mortar? I mean, well, being yeah. Ashler, I mean, <laughs> you, you could say. I mean, it, it, what what was the history of it? Uh, have, were they using mortars? Yes, in, you, in you, you actually often used a lamp, but used a very fine mortar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is where the aggregate comes into play. In fact, if you use a lamp putty of Ashler, uh, it was often used because it was the finest. It was hard. It all depends. Now, now you can use um, hydraulic because you can get yeah. your aggregates. Use cement now, I suppose. Uh, well, you shouldn't <laughs> use cement at all. If no, you use no, cement, no. you have an expansion joint problem, yeah. period, and it cracks and lets it in. But the aggregates are very important. I mean, there's a difference between a silicon aggregate and a calcareous aggregate, particularly when you're losing quick lime and the slaking process. So you've got to design accordingly if you're doing either. Also, if you're doing random rubble stones, you can use a, a, a very um, varied uh, mortar of different, different uh, um, aggregate of different size, depending on the stone. Because when you shake it, the, the, the strength of the mortar is the aggregate. The strength, the, the larger stones will get into the larger cavities if you use a very fat mortar, and that's how it works. If you're using um, pl planar type, uh, one from a quarry of flat surfaces, you use constant aggregate, because you don't want to have the varies. And these are important things, but they're not observed by a lot of people. And hence, you actually get relatively, potentially very weak structures. Are there any obvious examples in, in Ireland of, uh, say, repointing re Ashley masonry and, you know, oh, yes. some of the like, government buildings? Yeah, I'm sure some there. people here must probably have done it. I, I don't do much Ashley work. Yeah. Is it, if it, is it different to... Uh, uh, the mortar in a garden, a rough garden wall, you know, obviously well, uh, as very I finer, the finer aggregate. Aggregate is, yeah. is, is, is different. But, but other than that, it's the same technique. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I have a question there, Ivor, actually. Um, I remember a lecture in conservation course telling me that um, there was, uh, that you can get a, an adverse reaction between granite and lime mortars, is like historic Scotland must have come across that, or, or does it? Does it happen? Mm -hmm. They form gypsum, and you get spalling off of the granite, or you know, <coughs> maybe it's finer work, you know? No, in fact, the uh, one of the little. I mean, there were many little stories that are uh, anecdotal stories. I met a group of masons. I, I I heard they were up in, in up north. They'd always used a quick lime, so I went up to find out why. And they used it because one was bad weather, it was often wet, so they couldn't use an NHL, uh, so they said. And the other was granite, they wanted adhesion. And so they always used what their, what their grandfather used, and they had no trouble with it. In fact, there is a theory going that in the hot mixing process, the heat and certain aggregates bond a lot better. The molecules, they etch in one another. So in fact, anything it is good, not bad. Now, you can get a badly designed mortar with an impervious stone that will, will weep on you and, and spoil, but that's, again, it's been absorbed by the stone, that can happen as well. 
so it's important to design. But there's no, there shouldn't be anything hostile. Yeah, no, the theory was that if, you know this black crust that you kind of form on, mm -hmm. and, uh, some of that was blamed on. So what is this? Sorry. Uh, you, you know the black crust. You just get the gypsum crust sometimes on, yeah. on older buildings. Yeah. Well, some of that. There's a point in water. I, I'm not sure. I, I just uh, I, mm. I, I don't know much about it either, apart from that I've yeah. just heard well, about it. That's all. I was well, just wondering if it was a react. It's, it's mm. a not an open reaction then between gypsum, uh, to form gypsum, uh, granite, and lime mortars. Well, former gypsum. Yes, gypsum has we was eight months ago. I know about that and I. But gypsum is really frowned upon in our climates, and how it came about. And this is this is kind of rather sad. In the early days, people read textbooks about making mortars, and the textbook would be probably for southern France, and so they translate that and design the mortar and use it here, and you get gypsum in it, and you have problems. It doesn't take uh, gypsum for I exterior think it's more use. Gypsum salts, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you very much Larry, for your talk. Um, my name is Owen O'Reilly from the Structures and Construction Division. So I, I really am grateful for your sharing of knowledge and wisdom tonight. Um, just two questions. Uh, one, in relation to the, the lime mortar mixes, and you, you, you touched on the strength there. Was I getting from you the notion that maybe you should kind of err on, on lower kind of grades in order to pick up strength at, at longer stages? Or do you feel that because of the variance in the, in the lines and the aggregates, that that's kind of impacting on the results, the final results that you get. Would you prefer to err on the side of caution in terms of specifying the mixes? And um, secondly, would you be given a second talk on aggregates as well? Because uh, I think that's kind of very important with, with, with the mixes too. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the question. Yeah, basically speaking, I'm kind of deaf, that's why. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. I, I mm. bet if you're saying better. if you're operating in two rather than five, your strengths were going up to over 15. Yeah. And that you are you saying that maybe you feel that you'd operate at the lower end in order to get uh, you know a better result because of the variance? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, the the confusion that seems to be that caused by strength is again the cement industry predominates. And when mortars came to be strengthened to test, they used the cube test. Yeah. Now, fundamentally, the cube test is a concrete test. Indeed, I understand, and you might know better than me, but it really came into its own during the Second World War, where they had to get the planes down in 14 days. So they, they, they designed the concrete that would have a certain compact over a certain period on the runway so the planes could land. That was one of the reasons why it came popular. Because one of the advantage NHLs have got and I should have mentioned this, is that being a chemical set, you can pretty well calculate what you're going to get in 14 days' time. It might not be what you want, but you know what you're going to get. <coughs> With a uh, free lime <coughs> or a non-hydraulic lime or a quick lime mix not being gauged with an NHL, you, you depend on the gods. It's the weather. And so the carbonation can take a long time. And this can be a problem. And so that's one of the disadvantages. And that's why most of them were mildly hydraulic. They weren't hydraulic to get a compressive strength, the hydraulic to get a decent set, to have a mortar that was set to a degree that you could go away and leave it alone and let the carbonation continue. If you put, even an engineer will designing a mortar, not that they bother for an ordinary foundation of its brick, he won't be looking as for a mortar, not a concrete. He won't be looking for more than two or three newton anyway. That's that will be by design, by the spread and so on of it. Um, if you use too strong, parallel to compressive strength is brittleness and inflexibility. So if you go to too high compressive strength, you get too strong a mortar. And that's why cement is unattractive and not used and fails used for pointing for masonry work in most times. Is that the question? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Excuse me, thanks very much for your Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed listening to you. But I have a problem with ash or stone. You just cover it briefly there. But I find that you can use nothing if you're refining ash or stone except plain putty. It's the only thing you can pack in because the stone is a 
is a part of the structure of the arch or the car or the kinds or whatever it is. And there's a big issue there, and a lot of times you come across it where someone has used a saw, which is detrimental because they're actually cutting into the stone and they're affecting the structure of the stone, which they don't seem to realise. Now, on a few occasions there's been called up on drones where you use a hydraulic line to repaint them. That's not possible. I, I, I find that not possible. Well, I, I would agree with you. In fact, it all depends on how good the ashter is, whether I'm putty would be it. It might amuse you, by the way. I told you that story about the Scots using the quick lime. Yeah. I said, what you get specified? They said, oh, always oh, the NHLs. I said, well, what you do is the, the, the architects don't know the difference. <laughs> <That's their answer. laughs> so you should try that. That's all right for you to yeah. say that. <laughs> 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 on the glass scheme there that you spoke about, can you hear that on? Yeah. yeah. Um, when you break down an old rubble stone wall that has been built, say, in the 1800s, <coughs> you actually tease out the line model. You can actually feel an aggregate of somewhere between two, three, maybe even five yep. of stone and sand in the, in the model. Mm. Now, um, today we have to try and reconstruct those models for to pass the, you know, the, the, the grand scheme and that with the Heritage Council and that. What, what would you recommend uh, as a line mix for those old rubble walls to try and comply? Mm. Well, the, the reason, I would, this is always site specific and I don't want to give a long, prolonged question, but quite often one of the sad things you're forced to do is that uh, if it's a wall for building like a tower house, you're, you're actually are going to point, but you're looking at a bedding water. And it's all very well to put large aggregate in a bedding water one stone or the other. It's a very different matter if you want to point to the same specification. There's your problem. And really, that tower house should be what originally was, should be lime rendered or hard. And that's what was going on. However, custom and fashion and planning permissions make you put it back. Um, there are a number of solutions to it. And I can only give John Ashworth's one. He used to design his mortar. To, to what he think would weather and be compatible with what was there. And when he got to eye level, he would take the aggregate out of the old mortar and push it in while it was still green and then bang it in. So you got a vision of the old mortar and that was the little trick he did. That any help? Yes. Because <laughs> read around doors you can do that. Mm -hmm. John Ashurst, by the way, is a former a chief architect of English heritage mm -hmm. and a great educator, and he ran the West Dean at Fort Brockhurst. Again, Ed took me there. He's now left us, but he was an excellent teacher. I think those who met him always were benefited from it. Question at the back. How are you doing, Ivor? I had uh, met you before on the Trinity course, the conservation Indeed. course. Indeed, how are you? Doing a couple of great lectures, thank you very much. Um, I was away on a weekend recently with Spa of Ireland and they've done demonstrations of hotline mixing and things. Um, and the stone mason, he had this eye wash. It wasn't water he was using, it was something else, um, probably to neutralize. If you're mixing quick lime, if you're a reaction, if you have yeah. maybe squirted water in your eye. Is that water or is it? No, it's a special formulator. Chemical. Special formulator, yes. yeah. And you want to be kind of careful. It isn't quite the one that you use necessarily with cement because you're dealing with an alkali. Right. Um, often the classic one for, for eye contamination was things like sugar water, and that's not best to use in an alkali situation. So it's best to get a patent one. And actually, if you're on, I mean, irrespective of quicklime, you should have one of those close at hand. They actually can save your sight, yeah. you know, because it, the, the quicker you get it washed out, the better. Mm. Mm. Right, any other comments or questions? Maybe uh, no. Right, we should wrap it up by thanking Ivor again for his excellent presentation and uh, a very. Uh, stimulating uh, discussion that, that, that followed that. Uh, one thing I've been asked to do, a great pleasure, in presenting Ivor with a, with a book from the institution. Don't ask me who, who published it, I think it's an English book rather than an Irish book. But uh, the institution have become 
um, the I was going to say the owners, but the suppliers of, of these books. So we're starting a tradition tonight of presenting one to each of the um, the lecturers. So they are. Well, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Just to say, the, the next meeting of the Heritage Society um, is scheduled for Monday the 19th of November in association with the Civil Engineering Division uh, when the title of the lecture will be Thomas Mulvaney, Engineer and Arterial Drainage. Um, the speaker is Tim Joyce of the Office of Public Works, so that should be a good evening. So the session is now concluded. Safe home.